Amen. Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I've observed your precepts. I've restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I've not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From your precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. As a psalmist in Psalm, the longest psalm in the Bible. And then David the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. And the whole book of worship, you know, the Psalter, uh, begins... How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree, firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. John 8, 31. Jesus, therefore, was saying to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Abide. I wonder what comes to your mind when I say abide. They were pushing me for a sermon title. You know, they always are. They want it before Sunday. I don't know why. But anyway... I just said, just call it abide. <laughs> and I knew, I've, I've known for months, I've known for years really what I'm going to preach on today because uh, it is our habit, by the way, <laughs> the first Sunday of the year, we just make it a practice around here to come back to this matter of getting in God's Word. But I wonder what comes to your mind when I say abide. Maybe you think of, well, it's an emphasis. You know, we've had uh, this, uh, you know, this emphasis actually since September 7th around here at Southwest. Uh, it is a central New Testament concept. Abide. Uh, it's a year-long emphasis here at Southwest in the year 2015. We might have started September 7th, but we're not dropping it. And... Uh, we're going to make it the emphasis of 2015. And I pray, I pray that it will be a, a lifelong emphasis for every one of us uh, to abide in His Word. Indeed, it is the norm. Believers abide. 
If you have no heart for God's word, if you do not abide in his word, check your foundations. I'll be very blunt. It is the norm. If you abide in my word, then you're really my disciple, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And my prayer, actually, and I pray it often, is that this church will be making this the emphasis, and I'm not saying we'll have brown paper all the time, you know, and handwritten stuff coming out, but I'm telling you, I pray that we will abide in his word as a congregation till he returns. Till he returns. And I pray that for you, and I pray that for me, and I pray that for my kids. And I encourage you to abide. Now today, what I want to do is just uh, define it a bit. And then uh, give you eight practical ways to uh, abide in his word in 2015. Um, Tonight, Mike will, uh, as Bill mentioned, uh, address the issue of why I must abide in his word. And and I don't think I'm stealing his thunder. I think I'm whetting your appetite because he told me, we talked this week and we said, you know, what are you going to be saying? And we talked a little bit about it so we could coordinate a bit. But he already had a passion for, and I loved it, he said, why I must abide And he said, I'm going to be working out of Romans 7, and it caught me by surprise a bit. And he quoted verse 21. I find then this principle in me, that evil is in me, the one who desires to do good. And he said, I wake up in the morning, and I find this principle of evil within me, why I must abide. Come tonight. It's going to be a good time. I'm looking forward to hearing from Mike on that very practical, practical thought, and I'm sure he'll unfold much more than that. But uh, anyway, today what I want to do is uh, define it a bit and then uh, give some practical ways to abide. As I said, it's a central New Testament term. Uh, 122 times in the New Testament, me know the verb abide. Live, continue, stay, as in live. The context, if you watch for it, you'll see it translated in all these ways. But when he's, they asked him, where are you staying? You know, I ask you, where do you stay while you're in town? Where do you spend your time? Where do you live? Stay. Endure. Don't work for the food which perishes, Jesus said in John 6, verse 27, but work for, seek for the food which endures, remains, abides, me knows, endures. So to abide in his word is to stay, live, dwell, continue in his word. And interestingly enough, and I'd never really done this before, there are nine prefixes that the writers of the New Testament attach to the word. And uh, usually prepositions. And they'll strengthen the thought. And you'll see these same translations with a little more punch at times throughout the New Testament. And... uh, I won't go through all nine of them. In fact, I just suggest it to you, but the nine help us understand. But I will give you two of them just for interest's sake. And because they illustrate something, the preposition dia is attached to the front end. The prefix. And when you do that in, in the original language, it strengthens the thought to really remain. And I want to show you, turn over to Hebrews 1. I want to show you this mainly to get to Hebrews 1. Because any time you get a chance to go to Hebrews 1, you should. <laughs> it's a great chapter. But not, not really. Uh, although this whole book, Hebrews, is about Jesus. By the way, we're talking about his word today, but we're about him. And the superiority of Jesus. And he begins with this majestic description of our Lord Jesus. And uh, he's the creator. It parallels John 1. All things were created through him. Without him, nothing was created that's been created, John says. 
and Hebrews starts in the same way. And I'll pick it up at verse 10. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. Abide. Continue. Stay. They'll all become old as a garment. As a mantle, you'll roll them up. As a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Our God remains. Our Savior, this book goes on to say, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You counted on Him in 2014. You came to know Him in 2013. You've learned that He's trustworthy. I'll tell you what, 2015... He will not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He remains. Now, this this blows me away. We're coming around the table today. And when he instituted this, in Luke 22, we'll get there in a couple weeks or so, or a couple months, I'm not sure. But (laughs) we'll, we'll get there. Lord willing. Turn over to Luke 22 for a minute. Because, you know, when he instituted the table, he told them, you know, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. One of you is going to betray me. And are you as blown away as I am by verse uh, 24? Right after he told them that, there arose a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be greatest. (laughs) Do you ever feel unworthy to come around the table? I'm telling you, the table is for sinners who found Jesus Christ. These guys loved the Lord, but they were capable, right as he's telling them that he's going to be betrayed by one of them, they're having a little side argument about who's the greatest among them. Sounds like us sometimes. But at that point, this is what brought me to this passage, and this is what I say blows me away. Look at verse 28. You know, he kind of corrects them. He says, look, don't be arguing about who's going to be greatest, etc. And then he says, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. Could he say that? Grace. What did he say? You are those who have remained. He uses this strengthened verb, dia meno. You have stood by me in my trials. Now I can see it when he's saying the heavens are going to pass away, but you remain. But when he says that you have hung in there, stuck to it, stood by me, I'm blown away. But I share that with you because uh, the one prefix that is by, you know, they're they're used throughout the New Testament, 122 times without prefixes, without just meno, but many, many times with these uh, prepositions attached as a prefix to strengthen the word, and the one that uh, overwhelmingly is used the most is hupo meno. And hupo has the idea of under, and the idea is to live under. Under. And what he's after, and the way it's usually translated, is persevere. Stay under your circumstances. Don't run. <laughs> Hang in there. Endure. It's translated as a noun or a verb, as endurance or endure, perseverance or persevere. Jesus Christ, fix your eyes on him. And run the race with endurance. Don't quit. Consider him who endured such hostility. You endure. Run with endurance. That's what he says in Hebrews 12. You'll find it all over. But I share these with you because what it gets at is a great truth. To abide in God's word. To continue. To stay. When we abide, it produces abiding. When we stay, the act of staying 
produces staying power. When we continue, the act of continuing produces continuance, if you will. And you'll see it all through the New Testament. To abide in Christ is to abide in his word. To abide in his word is to abide in Christ. Look at John 15 for just a moment. John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. To see, when I say stay in God's word, I'm saying stay in Christ. And when I say stay in Christ, abide in Christ, I'm saying abide in his word. They're inseparable. And while we do these things, he produces. As we persevere, he produces perseverance. As we just hang in there with his word, he produces hanging in there in all of life. It's his fruit. It's the way he manifests the life of Christ. The life of Christ comes through his word, if you will, by his spirit and produces in us these things. Do you want staying power? Abide in his word. Do you want to be a finisher? Abide in his word. By the way, have you ever thought about the casualties in the Christian life? I mean, we, we're, we're around them all the time. The dinner table this week, it came up. Casualties, if you will. Uh, washouts. Look back at the case history of spiritual casualties, of those who wash out, of those who bring reproach to the name of Christ. And you will see that there was a failure to abide. It may be started with neglect. Perhaps it became you know, boring. And neglect turned to disrespect. Why did he write it this way anyway? Why didn't he make it more simple? Just give it to me dumbed down, will you? Just give me something, you know. The whole church is prone, prone to that today. And preachers are more than willing to just, you know, yeah, read some Bible, but let's just talk. And let's get down to the nitty-gritty of it and just... Now, there's a place for that. Don't misunderstand me. But to disrespect his word can quickly learn, lead to, you know, a neglect, to get to where you say it's boring, to where you actually disdain it. And by the way, every time I preach a sermon like this, I know there will be those who say, well, you just kind of make a little too much. It's legalism. You make a little too much of reading your Bible all the time. That's, you Listen, those who start to neglect and disdain and even, I should say, disrespect and even disdain the Scripture are often clever enough in the church to accuse those who abide, who hunger, who feed on His Word of being a little legalistic. Don't you listen to that. The evil one is a liar. And he lies about the essentials. He lies about who Jesus is. I was, I was thinking of the copying we've been doing. And uh, was it yesterday, day before, right in there, Luke 4? The first words out of the tempter's mouth, what? If. You're the son of God. He lies about the deity of Christ. He lies about the sufficiency of Scripture. You don't really need the Bible. In fact, that's kind of legalism to just be talking about getting in your Bible every day. You just make a religion out of it that way. No, I just tend to go with the flow. Listen, he's subtle, and he's got a lot of spokesmen today. But if anyone's trying to pull you away from the Scripture, I'd say look out. Look out. Jesus uh, 
didn't. Didn't. Now let me give you eight practical ways to abide. Uh, eight practical ways to abide in God's Word. First, pray. Open my eyes, Lord. Go to the Bible prayerfully. And when I say pray, I'm thinking two things, really. Go with that prayer. Lord, help me hear from you. This is the mind of Christ we've got, 1 Corinthians 2 says. I want to hear from him. I don't want to just go through the motions. So pray. But then secondly, turn that around and pray the Scripture. Uh, that verse I read earlier. Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. The term there uh, is, has the idea of devotion, praying, musing. Right in the definition, to pray God's word. Let me encourage you. That can help your prayer life and it can help your Bible life uh, to just pray God's Word. Use His Word. Read it right back to Him. Secondly, read it. <laughs> Sounds simple. Sounds so simple. But our Lord used to say quite often, didn't He? It is written. In fact, three times, didn't He? When we were copying out that uh, portion in Luke 4. When the devil came to him, what did Jesus say each time? It is written. He said that a lot. The Bible says that a lot. God took the time to write something. He wants it read. Think of those two statements that Jesus would often make. It is written, and haven't you read? Sometimes busy people important public figures, I read, you know, different ones who will say, um, I read every response. I, I can't personally uh, write you back, but I read. I make it a practice to read every response. Why do they say that? Well, they're busy. They're getting swamped, perhaps, with people responding to their blog or their public ministry or whatever, and they're saying, I read every one of those. I want you to know they'll look in the camera. I read every one. I don't always have time to respond. I appreciate that, don't you? They're saying something there. They're saying what? If you take the time to write them, they're going to read it. God took the time to write us. But it's so long. And a hundred other things we might say, don't say it. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Don't let that be your response. I don't have time to read it. I don't even have time to read it. Give me a summary, will you? Give me something quick on Sunday morning that I can just grab onto. No, read it. Read the Bible. Read. I, uh, I remember picking up a book by James Gray. <coughs> He was the president of Moody back at the turn of the century. He was greatly used to teach a lot of people how to abide in God's word. And he put at the forward of his book his five rules for reading the Bible. Read it. Read it prayerfully. Read it repeatedly. Read it reverently. And read it independently. Don't read the Bible helps right away. Just read it. And James Gray was used in many, many... You know, he wrote that little book, How to Master the English Bible that has touched so many lives. Uh, that was part of that era. They gave themselves to the Word of God. And God used it. John Mitchell, you know, challenged me to read repeatedly. And I often challenge you because it so impacted my life to really just read the Bible. And it wasn't new with Mitchell. You know that little Bible study, I think it's called Bible study, the little pamphlet we reprinted from Mitchell, and I think it's out in our resource center. He told of how as a young man he sat under G. Campbell Morgan, and afterwards he said, how do you study the Bible? And Morgan was this austere British, world-famous Bible teacher, 
and he, he looked at him, and Mitchell was young, and he said, if I told you, you wouldn't do it anyway. <laughs> and Mitchell said, try me. And Morgan told him that before he ever picked up a pencil to write, he read a book. Romans, Luke, whatever he was studying. He would read it from 30 to 70 times before he'd pick up the pencil. And Mitchell was just stubborn enough to try it. <laughs> and I encourage you to read God's Word. Thirdly, read aloud. <laughs> a way to abide in God's Word. The uh, Old Testament term for meditate means to growl, roar, utter, has that idea. Read it aloud. There's something about reading it aloud. This week, you know, we had the grandkids, and we were having a great time just kicking back most of the week. And uh, our nine-year-old was wanting to read Matthew. And so we sat down one night, and she would read, and then her seven-year-old brother, first grader, would read, and then Grandma would read, and then Dad would read, and then Grandpa would read, and then we'd go back around the circle. And it was such a good time around that table. We read Matthew 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And these little guys, and little girl and guy, you know, reading out loud. And then when the adult would read, it would go a little better, a little less sounding out, you know. But, boy, howdy. I learned a lot. And I think that night might have been my favorite night. Uh, better than gin rummy, you know? <laughs> better than uh, quite a few things, really. It was a great time. You say, Scott, you're a nine-year-old. You must have a special nine-year-old. Our seven-year-old, oh, they wouldn't sit still for that. Listen, I notice that kids do what dad and mom do. You know what I mean? Read aloud the Bible to your kids. Last Sunday, man, I was here and I loved it. I appreciated Dave's sermon. Thank you. It, was, it touched my heart, but I didn't have to. I mean, I got out of here. At, you know, I was, and I was fresh. I broke my tradition because my tradition on Sunday afternoon is hibernation. A long nap. But my son and sons-in-law were all here, you know, and we had our annual punt, pass, and kick deal over at Southridge, you know, and so we, and there'd been smack talk going on all week, who's going to kick it the furthest, where's going to pass, you know, and the, what are the rules, how many arguments we're going to have. We get over to Southridge, and I've got all kinds of energy, I'm going to beat these young bucks, you know, <laughs> but you know what I noticed over there is I ran into two different parents that we knew. Who were there on a cold, chilly day at Southridge football field? The man was running laps with his daughter to get her ready for soccer. And the mother, another over here, was kicking goals and stuff with the kids, helping them. Kids, kids will do things. My kid would never run laps. You do it with them, and you'd be surprised what they'd do. And it'll make them a good soccer player. Kick goals with them, even on the cold days. You know, we do that, don't we? We learn that in every area. Read aloud. Read aloud with your family. Fourth, copy. Copy. Turn to Deuteronomy 17. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 17. Copy it out. Hand copy the scripture. Deuteronomy 17, he said, when you ask for a king, you're going to. And when you get a king, there's several things I don't want him to do. And there's one thing I want him to do. And this is long before they got their king. But verse 18, <clears throat> now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, 
that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, in order that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. When you get a king, and he's busy with all the things a king is busy with, running the whole nation, taking care of the cabinet meetings, the ambassadors, all the issues, whether to raise the tax code, you know, all that stuff. I want him to write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll. God thought it was worthwhile for the king of Israel to write out the book of the law for himself in the presence of the priests. I didn't know that existed as a sophomore at Portland State when I got into the habit of finding that it helped me abide to just copy out Scripture. And I've made it part of my routine, and I can tell you it's valuable. And since September 7th, when I gave you the 30-day challenge, hundreds of you are doing this and finding it to be so valuable. It slows you down. It makes you think. You see things, don't you? You're telling me. I think every four-year time, every, you know, and I tell you, people are telling me, and I'm saying, yeah, I know what you mean, because it works the same for me. Copy it out. Simple thing to do. Many have never thought of doing it. Hundreds of you are, and uh, starting January 4th today, <laughs> you know, we've got a new schedule. You got it there in your bulletin. Let me find it here in my dollar store journal. And uh, today, Luke 4, 29 through 37. Did you notice a pattern there? We're continuing in Luke. And, uh, you know, I timed it, so we got the early chapters of Luke. Didn't you enjoy that? Before the Lord's birth, and then right on Christmas Eve and Christmas morning, you know. And now we're going to continue in Luke, but we're also going to go for the week of prayer into some of the prayers of Scripture. And then we'll be back in Luke. And I want to just encourage you that uh, if you haven't tried this, you might want to just join up with us. Just continue. Get yourself a journal and uh, start today and make this a pattern for 2015. If you're just starting out, you might want to do the original 30 day. And I, so I printed that on the back here too. And so you can on today, you could start with Psalm 1. And there will be a wide variety of scriptures that I think you'll find. I kind of creamed the Bible that first 30 days, you know what I mean? And then the next 60. And we've been doing it, what, for four months and stuff. But my goal is that we would become those who do this as part of your routine. And when I say routine, I mean, I don't mean part of your routine. I mean part of your daily routine, your habit. Use God's Word in this way. Now, I know that uh, some of you aren't, and hundreds of you are. But some of you are struggling, or you found it hard. Uh, there's a wide variety of reasons for that. Some are complicated. Others are as easy as you got a spiral notebook for all. What in the world were you doing with a spiral notebook? <laughs> and then some of you didn't get the dollar store journal. You tried to get the Walmart one. I know, it's 88 cents. It doesn't open as well. I checked it out. No, I'm kidding, obviously. But I'm telling you, give it a shot. They say, I don't know if it's true, because it hasn't worked for me in other areas. But they say you can establish a habit in 30 days. You know, I don't know if that's really true, because, well, give it a shot. But... You don't have to stop at 30 days. That's why we did a 30-day challenge, and there was just this groundswell. Let's keep going. So keep copying. Enjoy God's Word. Uh, you might want to just join us. Uh, you know, 10 minutes a day, that's how long those time, times take. If you, if you stop and mull it over, it might take you 15. If you really enjoy yourself, it might go 20 or 30. That's not the end of the world. <laughs> to spend a half an hour with your beloved Savior listening to his voice it might take your whole devotional time 
Worst things could happen. Okay, that's four. Wow, that's four. We're out of time. <laughs> and I have a New Year's resolution to manage the clock. So five, six, seven, eight, they weren't very good anyway. <laughs> let's, just, <laughs> let's just shut it down. Thank you. I was hoping somebody would say that. Now I'll give you five, six, seven, and eight real quick because we're not going to do a part two. But let me give you five, six, seven, and eight very quickly because we want to get to the table and we want to help your pastor manage his time better. So anyway, five, teach, teach. I know he says in James 3, not, not everybody become teachers. You're going to be held. Become, but the, in Colossians 3, it says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, teaching and admonishing one another. We're not all teachers, but we are all to be teaching. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, he says, teach the things you've learned from me and pass them on to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We're all to be teaching. Let me just encourage you that one of the best ways to abide in his word, my Bible life took off when I began to teach it to others. And yours will too. We were made not to just sit there and soak it up and sour, but to give it out. In 2015, why don't you teach someone what you know from God's word? You say, well, there's not too many that I could, well, find one. I'm not very mature. I, I will find someone who knows less than you. And it's not a matter of who knows the most either. It's just teaching and admonishing one another. I encourage you to think about that, pray about that this year. Uh, why let another year go by without you decide? Just think if all of us taught someone the impact that could have. Just think about your own life in that way. Sixth, meditate. Meditate. I mentioned this briefly. The Hebrew word for meditate is very parallel to the Greek word, in other words, Old Testament word, New Testament word, meditate, abide. And the word meditate, oh, how I love your law. I meditate day and night. How happy is the man who doesn't get all his input from the magazines and the blogs and the phone and all the other stuff. No, no, his, he meditates in God's word day and night. That's the happy guy who will enjoy himself. No, this isn't something of drudgery. This is enjoying, and it means to chew the cud. It means to hang in there and think about it. Do that. That's six. Seven, memorize. When's the last time you memorized a verse of Scripture? Now, some of you would say, well, yesterday. Many of you memorized large chunks of the Bible, and I say, hang in there, keep it up. But some of you, some of us might have to say, boy, that was when I was a kid, or I never have. I don't know how people do that. I know it's counterculture. So is reading. So is meditating. All these things are counterculture. But let me tell you something. We memorize things that really mean a lot to us. Thy word I have treasured in my heart in order that I might not sin against you. Psalm 19, 119, verse 9. God's word memorized is so valuable. Uh, think about memorizing. Uh, in fact, do it this year. You don't have to memorize great chunks. It would be great if you did. Memorize a verse. Uh, eight. Quote it. Quote God's word. I don't. I say it right, right after memorize, but I'm not saying just quote the verse you memorized. I'm just saying quote God's word. You know, I, I uh, grew up listening to Russ Hodges. He was the announcer for the Giants, and I loved Russ Hodges. He was such a great baseball announcer. And then John Miller came along, and I think he's better. And John Miller loves to quote Russ Hodges because he grew up listening to Russ Hodges, and Russ Hodges is in the baseball announcers hall of fame or something i don't know you know what i don't even know what they talk about it though and john miller will say like russ hodges used to say and then he'll quote russ hodges why does he do that because he loves russ hodges why do politicians quote winston churchill or you know because they honor the source 
and it adds punch to what they're saying. You and I can quote Almighty God. And it's a way to not only abide, to, to do it, you've got to get in there and know it, but it's a way to encourage others to do just the same. Politicians, preachers, baseball announcers, you name it. Quote people that mean something to them. You and I ought to quote God's Word. Eight practical tips. There's many more. We could go on and on, but I break my New Year's resolution. We're going to stop. Uh, if you're new with us, let me tell you, we're all about Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, we all came to know him through this book. One way or another, somebody quoted it to us or read it to us or explained it to us, and we see who Jesus really is. If you don't know who Christ is, let me tell you, he's the Son of God. He died on the cross for you and me, and he rose again, and he's coming back. And we who know him, we love to get to know him better by listening to his word. So we're going to come around and enjoy communion, uh, a picture of our intimate fellowship with him. Father, 